All right, number 19. So the histogram shows information about the numbers of minutes some people waited to be served at a post office. Okay, so we have a couple information. We've got the class widths, which is represented by number of minutes. We have a frequency density, in other words, the height. So if you multiply these two values, you get the total frequency, i.e. the number of people. Or in this case, yep, the number of people. Now it wants us to work out an estimate for the proportion of these people who waited longer than 20 minutes to be served. Now, notice how to use the word proportion and not number. So we need to make sure our answer is going to be like a decimal or a fraction or percentage of the amount. So what you could do is firstly work out the area of every single block. That's the easiest way to do it. So let's have a look. So if we look at this carefully, so this goes up to 5, 10 and so on. So for instance, this block here, 10 to 15, it has a class width of 5 and it has a vertical height of, what is it? It's going up in point ones here. So it's going to be 2.2. So 5 times 2.2. And that'll give us 11. So we, that's what you just want to do. Work at the area every block. So this block here has a class width of 5 and a height of 3.4. So it'll be 5 times 3.4, which is 17. And the next one here, so let's do it for each one. Yeah, I'm going to do this quick. This block here is going to be, oof, what's that? So, so you've got 10 blocks. So it's going up in point, uh, fives. So point five, one. So this, this has a class width of two and this has a class width of three. So this would be two times 2.5, which is five. So this is two times 2.5, which is five. This one here is 3 times 4, thankfully, a whole number, which is 12. So that's how many people we've got here. And then on this long block, which is easy, is this is a class width of 15. The difference is 15. 15 times oh, 1, so 15. So that's easy. Now we need to work out an estimate for the proportion of these people who wait longer than 20 minutes. So longer than 20 minutes is from here. We're talking about this across. So we know that um, the number of people who wait longer than 20 minutes were, let's see, we've got 10 by 1. So we've got 10 people. Now it's going to be 10 people out of the total population. So we need to add up all of these numbers. So it's going to be 5 plus 12 plus 17 plus 11 and plus 15. It's going to be 60. So 10 out of 60. In other words, 1 out of 6. Yeah, that's it. So we've got A, B, C, and D are points on a circle. So we've got a four-sided shape enclosed in a circle, yeah? P, C, Q is a tangent to a circle. So we've got a straight line. And tangent means it's a line that touches a circle or a curve anywhere at exactly one point. So this is the one point it's talking about. Okay? A, B equals C, B. So the lengths of A, B is identical, hence the, the lines here. And B, C, Q equals X. So this angle here is X. Prove that the angle at CDA, so CDA, so that's why I labeled it D. We need to show that this angle D equals 2x. Give reasons for each stage in your working. Okay, so a few things you have to notice here. Yeah? When you have a shape, when you have a four-sided shape enclosed in a circle and it has to touch every point, we can say that the opposite pairs of angle must add up to, so let's say A and C, must sum up to 180. Okay, by the way, this is known as a cyclic quadrilateral because it fits within the circle quadrilateral is that how you spell it anyway that means a and c must add 180 and therefore d and this angle let's call it b must also add up to uh, 180 okay so that's that's one thing so another theorem which is also important to know is the alternate angle theorem i'm going to write it down they say that the angle between a tangent and the chord, which is here by the way, this is the chord, is equal to the angle on the other side of the chord. So, but this only occurs if it's a triangle. So you have to imagine splitting this up into a triangle. So then you're going to say this angle here equals part of the angle D here. So let's call this, let's split this angle D in two bits here. Yeah? Let's call this one D1 and D2. We can say that X equals D1. So let's replace this D1 now with X. So that's what it means right there. And we can call this angle here um, d minus x because d minus x plus x gives you the full the full d <laughs> yeah okay so that's called the alternate angle oh, alternate segment theorem
Okay, so if you want to write an equation, you can say angle, so that's angle X. Angle X equals angle, what was that? CDB, yeah? Okay, so that's good so far. And and another thing is, remember, I said we said angle on the other side of the chord, right? So another side of the chord could have been if the chord was here. If the chord was here, this means on the other side's angle would appear over here, so part of A. So then this would also be equal to x so that's another angle so we can say that angle x can also equal um what's it c a b angle c a b so that's another one cab okay so it looks like we have a bunch of triangles now don't we now the importance of having an angle x here is because if you look at this triangle we can see it's isosceles because you've got a line marked there and a line marked here an isosceles uh, triangle means two angles and lengths are the same. So this angle must also be X because it's pretty much the same. So we've got X here. And and now finally, this is gonna this is kind of a cool trick. Now if you take the, the collective total of this angle here, X plus X, this would equal uh, 2X. So pretty much angle, um, let's say AC to Q. Angle AC to Q is now equal 2X. And using the alternate segment theorem again, on the other side of this massive triangle, so if you just cut out this line for a second, yeah, let's call this back to D again, yeah. You can see on the other side of um, this, uh, well, this angle here, this is going to lead up to over here. This must also be 2x, because remember, if this is 2x, according to this, the theorem, the other side is also 2x. And it's proven. So this means um, angle, what's it called? CDA equals 2x and we proved it okay number 21 so line l has equation 4y minus 6x equals 33 line m goes through two different points and this line l is perpendicular to line m okay so in in order to find out if lines are perpendicular it's very important if we rewrite the equations in the usual y equals mx plus c form okay so this is pretty much fundamental yeah now, for the first line, we can rewrite that. In, to rewrite it nicely, you can firstly plus 6x across and then divide the equation by 4. So you get something like 4 equals uh, 6x over 4 plus 33 over 4. <coughs> and this equation can now be simplified to y equals 3 over 2x plus 33 over 4. So we're not too concerned about the constant here. Yeah? We're concerned about the gradient m, 3 over 2. So we know that, that these two lines are perpendicular. That means the gradient, which was 3 over 2 for line L. And so the gradient for M is going to be the negative reciprocal of L. So it be minus 2 over 3. In other words, you flip it upside down and change the sign to minus for line M. Okay, so now we have this information. We can use a new Y equals MX plus C line and replace our new information. So we've got M equals minus two over three X plus C. So now we just have to work out what the value C is. And to do that, we go back to our line M and see what points it cuts through. So apparently a line at point A cuts through five and six when X is five and Y is six. So replace your X and Y with five and six. So we're gonna have six equals minus two over three times uh, five, which is minus 10 over three plus c and now we can solve the value of c which is going to be 6 plus 10 over 3 and in your calculator you get 28 over 3 so that's perfect so therefore our equation on line is now y equals minus 2 over 3 x plus 28 over 3 this helps guys yeah it's always good to do it like this and now finally um we want to find the value k k is located at point b so now let's replace um the corners into that new equation so when x is minus 4, y is k. So it's going to be k equals um, minus 4. So it'll be minus 2 thirds times minus 4, which is plus 8 thirds, plus 28 over 3. And adding those two values up, you're going to simply get k equals 12. And that's it. Okay, question 22. So the diagram shows a cone. So here's our cone. And by the way, guys, you're actually given um, some formulas for cones in the front of this book layer. Let's see what they want. So AB is the diameter of the cone, which is over here. V is the vertex of the cone, so the point at the top. 
given that the area of the base of the cone in proportion to the total surface area of the cone is 3 to 8, work out the size of the angle AVB. So this angle up here. Let's call this angle um, X here. Yeah? Okay, Ooh. give your answer correct to 1 dp. Uh, this one looks a bit frightening now, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so let's have a look at this carefully. So first things first, let's answer what they want. They want the area of the base of the cone, yeah? So we're talking about this area of a circle. So the area of the circle here is literally pi r squared. Okay, so we'll leave it like that, pi r squared. Okay, so for the total surface area of the cone, it comes under two parts. Firstly, it's actually the, the, surf, the, circle, the area of the base plus the curved surface area. And the curved surface area is actually in the front, which is pi r l. Okay, now L is actually the diagonal length here. So we can call this diagonal length L, yeah? So that's one formula. Radius from here to here, yeah? So, so far so good. Okay, so now filling out this information, so we've got everything labeled. We can say that the area of the base of the cone now is, of course, pi r squared 2. The total surface area, which is going to be pi r L plus pi r squared. So it'll be pi, and actually we can factorize this. You can factorize pi r on both of them. So pi r, and then you'll be left with r plus l. Okay, so looks okay. Now apparently this is equivalent to 3 parts, and this is equivalent to 8 parts, right? Now a good thing about ratios is that you can literally treat the parts as total bits. So we know altogether that there's going to be 11 parts, right? And we can say, alright, we, we know that 3 out of 11 parts is represented by pi r squared over all of these combined, yeah? So it'll be pi r squared over pi r squared plus uh, pi r r plus l in other words this over everything is going to equal 3 out of everything 3 out of 11 <clears throat> what we could do is just literally multiply the, the denominators across to clear them out so we're going to have 11 times pi r squared equals 3 times these lot of the bottom so th um, pi r squared plus 3 times and next oh yeah we're going to expand this as well 3 times pi r squared plus 3 times pi r l so i basically expanded this and multiplied it by 3 yeah okay and then let's have a look let's collect like terms yeah so we're going to have actually you know what you can do you can actually cancel all the the pies let me just change the color of the pen so the pies go actually they all go and then you can cancel one power of r so this goes this becomes 1 1 1 so now you've got 11r equals 3r plus 3r, which is 6r plus 3l. And you can actually um, make an expression for l. So you can subtract 6r, so you've got 5r equals 3l. And therefore, dividing by 3, l equals 5r over 3, or 5 thirds of r. Now, why did I do this? Well, since we're trying to find this angle here, a clever technique is to actually realize that this is in the shape of a triangle. So let's redraw this at the bottom, yeah, so you can see more clearly. I admit it is quite tricky. If we slice this in the middle, we have a right angle triangle, a length of R and a length of L. What we know what L is now is 5 over 3R. So 5 over 3R. Okay, that just looks terrible. And we're trying to find the total angle, but let's just call this angle Y for now, yeah? So we split in the middle, so when you work out Y, you can double it to get X. So to get this angle, notice how this is a right angle triangle, so we can use Soka Toa. It's actually really hard this question. <laughs> so Soka Toa, and we just use the relevant size. Because this is an angle of interest, Y, this means um, this op the opposite angle Y will be O, so this is the opposite, and this is going to be the hypotenuse. So we need something that has O and H, and the only thing that satisfies it is a So, so not Ka or Toa. So it's going to be sine of the angle y equals opposite r over 5 thirds of r. And you're going to notice a trick here, that the r's actually cancel out. So you're left with, and if you cancel out, you got 1. So you'll be left with sine y equals 1 over 5 thirds. Now all you want to do is literally sine inverse this. So sine inverse, yeah, don't bother simplifying that, yeah? <clears throat> 1 over 5 thirds. So sine inverse... 1 over 5 divided by 3. You're going to get something like 0.8 dot dot dot. And because y is only half the angle of the total, remember you want x, which is double. You're going to times your answer in your calculator by 2. 
So times two, and you're gonna get an angle of 73.7 degrees. And I believe this is the answer, I hope. And here we go, guys, the final question. Let's do this. So ABCD is a trapezium, okay? Actually, it's probably best to draw this out. It's always good to draw this out, so uh, I don't know which side. Now it says that the direction from D to C equals three times the direction from A to B. So there's a good chance that this is probably, let's see, this is probably A to B and this is D to C because apparently DC is three times bigger than AB. So to make it more clear, it's better to put this AB and uh, DC. Yep. Now, apparently, if you go from 2 to A, which is here, you get this vector, minus 2, 3. If you go from D to B, so all the way across, you go from minus 1 to 7. So it wants us to find the exact magnitude of BC. Well, to get BC, let's have a look. The trick is, is to travel any possible route until you get to C from B. So what we could initially do is go from B to D and then figure out what D to C is. So let's do that. So we can say that B to C is like going from B to D, then from D to C. Now, to work out B to D, well, we actually we actually have it, B to D, is the reverse of D to B. So it'll be positive 1 and minus 7. Now, DC we don't have. However, to work out DC, we can actually work out AB and then multiply by 3. So let's work out A to B, yeah? So it's all about direction. To go from A to B, we can go from A to D and then D to B. So this would be traveling from A to D plus D to B. And we can do this quite straightforwardly. A to D is the reverse of D to A. So it'd be instead of minus two, it would be positive two and negative three plus, and D to B is minus one and seven. Minus one, seven. And then simplifying that, when you come to vectors, you just add across. So 2 plus minus 1 will become 1. Minus 3 as 7 is 4. So we found A to B. And of course, we know from the, from the very beginning, D to C is 3 times that value. So D to C is 3 times 1, 4, which is 3, 12. Easy, yeah? 3, 12. So now we know what this is. So it'll be 1 to minus 7 plus 3, 12. Tidying this up, adding across, you're going to get 4. Minus 7 at 12 is uh, 5. And now lastly, this is the end bit. Find the exact magnitude. The exact magnitude means is you literally use Pythagoras. And by the way, these two, uh, these two bars means the magnitude. So find the magnitude of 4, 5. It's literally 4 squared plus 5 squared. Square root. And we're done. We're actually done. Put this in your calculator. And you'll get root. And this is the exact magnitude. Make sure you do not round it up or you actually drop a mark. And yeah, guys, I think we're done.